EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. But tonight, I would like to know what is your burden tonight? hopeless are things in your life. They, it does seem hope a while. We don't see an end in view. Tonight we want to find out why it is we don't see an end in view. Why do we arrive at that kind of condition in our lives, you know? I thought I'd look at St. Paul. And I found that he was in a dysfunctional society too. Well, we can leave it drop, it don't matter. <laughs> this is a program, you see, if something don't drop out of the ceiling, it's gonna drop out of my book here. So, uh, either case, there's something gonna go around that should never happen on TV. Go, oh, it just happened, now we can relax, and I don't need to worry about anything here. So I'm going. I would like to show you something about St. Paul. I think I lost my place. How do you like that? Oh, well, we'll just take another place here. Here we go. Here's St. Paul, 1 Corinthians. And he says here, now here is a man of God, a man who had a fantastic conversion Phenomenal conversion. Blessed by God. A man whose handkerchief healed people. They used to snitch his handkerchief and, and, and it would heal people. A man who was absolutely wrapped in God. Well, let me, let me tell you what he says here. It's 1 Corinthians 4th chapter and the 10th verse, I guess, or 11th. He said, to this day, we go without food and drink and clothes. I mean, he was hard up. We are beaten and we have no homes. We are cursed. We answer with a blessing. When we are hounded, we put up with it. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop here in a minute. We are insulted, and we answer politely. We are treated as the scum of the world. Even to this day, the scum of the earth. Now, we have to ask ourselves a question. St. Paul was abused. If you were to say to Paul, if he was sitting here, and you'd say, well, I'm abused, and he could say, so was I. 
and you would say to him, but I'm hungry. And he would say, so is I. And I have no one, no friends. And he would say, neither did I. And you would say, I'm insulted. I'm offended. And he'd say, well, so is I. So what is the difference now between Paul, who suffered a lot of the things that everybody suffers today, and not only that, the persecution that we have today are little insults. You know, Mother Angelica's behind time. She's prevaticating. We've got a lot of saints prevaticating. Did you know that? I mean, we must have thousands of saints. They're all prevaticating. I'll buy it. I, I, whatever they had, I'll take it. Then you get these little jibes every so often, you know? But there's nobody threatening to throw you before a lion. Well, at least not yet. See, when they said persecution, they weren't talking about words bantering back and forth. They were talking about being put up and, and lit, set afire, or, or their heads cut off, or, or thrown before a lion. And that fear was so constant that they had to hide in catacombs. So now we've got to ask ourselves, well, what, how did they make it? And, and oh, we get so dis, in such despair and so disheartened. Tonight you call me and tell me, why, what puts you in that despairing mood? What are you disheartened over? And what are you disheartened about? I want to think the little thing more here would say, Paul, we are in difficult. This is Second Corinthians now. This poor man had a problem, didn't he? Huh? We are in difficulties on all sides, but never cornered. This is also the fourth chapter. We have no answer to our problems, but we never despair. Oh, now here we're talking about despair tonight. We're persecuted, never deserted, knocked down, never killed. Now, if you look at these two passages, you'll find the reason why we don't react in the right way to all these horrible things going on in the world. In here, St. Paul tells us that he, he says here, we answer with a blessing when they're cursed. When he worked and got nothing out of it, it was gentle. When he was hungry and beaten and had no place to go, he praised God. Now, if you look over here, you'll find out that he had a, a terrible, terrible difficulties. He would go and, and he'd preach to a whole group of people and maybe stay there six months a year. And as soon as he left, he started going down the drain. That's why we got these wonderful letters. So there was in the life of St. Paul the same, almost same difficulty, same fears, same anxiety, same persecution, same insults, same abuse. And yet he became a great saint and he died to cut his head off. I mean, you know. Now, these people had a different outlook than many people do today. And the reason is, in the beginning of Christianity, I think the faith was so strong. And today, I think especially in America, our faith is terribly, terribly, terribly weak. Why? Because we constantly compromise. We're always compromising. We compromise everything. And when you compromise, remember, you always lose something. You always lose something. You always give up something. 
And if you do it constantly, the first thing you know, you wake up some morning and you have nothing. But the faith, you see, that, that the people had then, and we should have now. They knew there was glory and merit in their suffering. They knew that they were imitating the Lord Jesus. They knew there was a, a most wonderful place in store for them. But Jesus said that. So with all that in mind, they never despaired. I mean, they had the same things. You know, women in those days, was, they were not worth nothing. Even in the gospel, they counted men. There were 5,000 men. They never even counted women and children. Now, you don't have that today. But a lot of people despair over that. Never despair. These things must come. You realize that our dear lady, who must have known for a long time, especially since she was a, a, a read the scripture so much, what our Lord would go through, she never despaired. Why? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to see the Father's hand in everything. Everything. Our dear Lord is a wonderful example of that. He saw him in everything. Even before Pilate, he said, you don't have any power over me unless it comes from the Father, from above. And see, we, we don't see, we don't see God in everything. We think, well, if God is in everything, why doesn't he change it? You and I, each one of us, has our own kind of purification. There's no way of getting rid of it. I think this nation is in store for great purifications. I've been telling you that for years. I'm going to tell it to you for a few more years. Because of abortion, because of a lack of, of adherence, the lack of trust in God. This nation is no longer under God. We don't know what it's under, but it's not always under God. People are not faithful to the laws of God. And, and so the more we drift away, the less able we're able to accept the persecutions, the abuse, the despair in the world, the wars and everything, that we can't accept that. Why? Our hearts must be filled with God if we're going to live in joy and hope. And you see, that's why a Christian has to be head and shoulders over the world. Because when you have faith, you see what nobody else sees. Everybody just sees headlines, sees terrible things going on. Everybody sees the worst. Everybody sees the, 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 the worst and, and, and the terrible things going on all over the world. The, the famine, the wars. It's not it has anything to do with you being arrogant. It, it's a real humility to know that this is all in the hands of God. Whatever is coming today. Not 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Today is a purification from the Lord. And we have created it. We create our own. If you, if you're, if, if you smoke a, a, a whole carton of cigarettes today, I don't know how you do that with that smoke coming out of your ears and <laughs> your mouth and everything else. But uh, if you did, you couldn't blame God for getting cancer now, could you, huh? Hmm? Well, what does it mean? It means that you must take the consequences of your actions. All the things that are going on in the world today, even those that are not at all responsible for any of this, we're all one body. We're all together. We're all sons and daughters of the same Father. Whatever anybody suffers, we're going to suffer. See, there, there's no way you can get away from it. 
But if we don't always keep our mind in heaven and have joy in our hearts and know that we're all going to another land, to another place. If we don't understand that, then I can, I can guarantee that all the terrible things that are going on all over the world, not counting volcanoes, floods, earthquakes, the whole thing, you're despair. There's no other way to go. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you from? Uh, we're from New York. Great. Uh, we love your show and continue the great work. Thank you. Uh, Mother Angelica, um, you know, my wife and I, uh, we have three children, and we have uh, one on the way in June. Praise and uh, we're just wondering, you know, what, you, what advice you can maybe give us um, you know, when my wife and I grew up, the world was a much different place. Uh, you know, there were a lot of family-oriented things going on and, and values and what have you. Um, and it just seems as the world has progressed, it's, it's much more difficult now, I think, than ever to try and raise your children properly. And uh, I just was wondering what type of advice you can give us, because I am very concerned um, with what we can do to really try and put them in the right direction, and not only our children, but parents of other children because I feel uh, it's so important because they're the future of our country and, and of our world. How old are your children? Um, one is eight, one is going to be seven, three, and the baby coming in June. Praise and God. Uh, like I say, I'm just very concerned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I know when I was a kid that, you know, we could watch a lot of good family-oriented programs on TV and you could leave your house open and your car open and you didn't have to worry anything. And you know, there's all these drive-by shootings, and, and the list goes on and on with the drug problems and what mm -hmm. have you. And uh, what can we do? I mean, uh, until the Lord comes and, and changes it around and puts this world straight, what can uh, my wife and I and all of us uh, other parents out there, what can we do to uh, contribute to, you know, trying to make our young people grow up and, uh, and do well? Well, I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's a process. First of all, you have to be those loving parents that your children need to have amidst children who have no parents at all or parents who don't care. I think you have to raise them in the faith. I know you can no longer depend upon sister so-and-so because sister so-and-so isn't there. Uh, you, you need to take that responsibility fully upon yourself. You and your family need to pray together for the simple reason that when children learn to pray young, they continue to pray when they get older. And you be a yeast. You see, I think what happens among those who, like yourself, uh, you, you forget that your duty in today's world is to be a yeast in this sourdough that is the world today. We have to have a new dough and a, a new yeast. And the Lord will provide this new dough. But in the meantime, you have to give example of being loving, caring parents. And if you go to any school, private or public school, where your children are not taught good morals, then have homeschool. If they're not taught the right catechism, you teach them the catechism. And, and I think you have to take this very seriously, but let your, never allow you, your wife, or your children lose hope. You see, Christians today have to have Christian hope. That hope is not centered in the world. The world has fallen apart. You have to have your hope in the Lord that even though everything seems so terrible, it's in his hands. And if it's in his hands, we do what we can with those around us in our neighborhood. We, we pray. See, the, Our Lady keeps saying over and over and over since 1917, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. We're all so sophisticated today that we have the slightest idea that a little rosary could change the world. Well, we now we know, not saying that little rosary, what it's done to the world. And, and we have to understand our own responsibility, and you do that. And I think you have to take that responsibility on yourself, because if you look around, 
You know, I, I got a phone call the other day from a teacher who quit school because two students came at her with a gun. I can remember a sister I had, a nun, and I would have liked to see somebody go after her with a gun. I, I, I would love to have seen that happen, you know? That poor kid wouldn't have known whether, what world he was in. He'd have seen stars like nobody ever saw. But you see, there's this dangerous, this terrible, terrible conditions we're in, and they're not going to get better. They look like they're getting worse. But we got to be like St. Paul. If we're insulted, we answer and we're jumping us. If we're abused, we see we we have to accept the conditions of the world. We do all we can to change it within the scope was in that little world we're all in. We're all in a little world. I went to see my aunt in Philadelphia one time, and I went more places when I went to see her than she went, and she lived there for 30 years. All she had was her little neighborhood, which was Pashyunk Avenue. Everybody's like that. Most people, they live in a certain place in their little world, and that's what you got to change. That's what you have to pray for. And I, I think if you train your children to understand that the thing that's going to change the entire world is prayer. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for your governors. You need to pray for your mayors. You need to pray for all of these people that have responsibility, for priests, for bishops, for cardinals, for our Holy Father. Maybe if we prayed more, things would be better. And if you pray and you say, well, things are getting better, then we must humbly accept what isn't getting better with the humility of heart. It's my purification. It's your purification. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? I'm calling from Chicago. And what is your question? Um, well, I, my fiancé and I have been living together for the last four years, and we didn't do it intentionally to just to live together was kind of a thing we were going to eventually get married and I didn't think at the time that I would be able to ever have children but that kind of changed after about a year of being together and now we've he's two and now I have another one on the way and now my fiance has kind of changed his mind about getting married right now and I feel so bad about it but I didn't do it deliberately you know, to hurt our Lord or anything like that, but it was just, I was thinking of myself at the time and nobody else. And I have gone to church, but no priest will listen to me. Well, sweetheart, you made a mistake, see? I know we didn't want to, but you know, you're suffering the consequences of this now, you see? And, and the consequences are there because, I hate to say this, but men so often, we had one the other night said the same thing. He doesn't want to get married. Why does he want to get married? He's got everything he wants. But you see, honey, you cannot longer live with this man. You can't live like you're a married woman when you're not because it's bothering you. You see what it's doing to you, sweetheart? And, and you got to really stop this relationship. See, it's hard to say this, huh? You know, you, you can't compromise. See, you're, you're all torn up inside because you understand now after all these years and three, two children, one on the way. So you have to, you can't constantly say no to God. You have to start saying yes to God. See, you'd be better to live by you're the one that's making the money. Be better to keep your job. You say, well, it's terrible to leave him. Is it not better to leave someone than to lose your soul? I don't think your intention was to hurt God, but you hurt God, you see? I wish I could have you right here 
and give you a big hug and dry your tears. I wish I wasn't <clears throat> so far away. I wish I could just give you a hug. Maybe somehow through God's grace you'll feel that hug. But the hug I would like to give you is to assure you that God will forgive and forget. You owe that to your children. This man is wavering. And if he loves you, marriage should not be a hard thing. And maybe that's what you're not able to face, huh? You've loved him and you've been sincere and you've given him everything you have. It's time now to stop. It's time to say, I've had enough. I'm not going to offend God. I'm not going to offend this temple of the Lord. I'm not going to offend my children. Your children deserve that you brought them into the world an example of love, purity, goodness, charity, and a, an example of God. There's no other words I can tell you. And that's why I wish I could just give you a hug and assure you of his love and his compassion. But number one, you need to go to confession Number two, you need to end this relationship or get married. If he doesn't want that, show him the door. You must, if you're going to give yourself to anyone, do it in the sacrament of marriage. You are already the breadwinner. The Lord will bless you and maybe wake him up. Men have a, a terrible habit of taking advantage of weak women. Be strong. Ask Jesus to help you. And he will. I will pray for you and your husband. Well, not really husband. Hopeful husband. Don't wait too long. Get your soul in order. We never know when the Lord will come. Let's be ready. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Mother Angelica. Yeah. Marie Mello from Middletown, Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, my daughter was murdered on the 4th of July, and uh, her husband set her on fire. Oh, dear Lord. And she came home uh, to me with her little six-and-a-half-year-old boy, and uh, her legs were burnt. She looked like a mummy when she came home, so badly burned. And uh, January 4th, she had to go to the trial, and uh, when she went to the trial in the courtroom, her husband shot her in the head and shot her in the chest, and uh, she was dead. And uh, she was shot at 8.30, and at 11.30, I was praying the rosary with EWTN, and that's when she died. And my uh, son uh, called and had a priest give her her last rites before she died. And Mother, it's been the Lord Jesus that's held me together and our beautiful lady. And... Uh, I just want to witness to the world how evil this world is and yes. so much violence in the world. Yes. And I've had the media here and the papers, and uh, the Lord has just carried me all through this. And uh, I offered it all up for you and EWTN and Thank everyone you, that supports EWTN. Thank you, Jesus. And everyone thinks I'm a little crazy, but no. I know Jesus and our beautiful lady, Mother, loves me very, very much. Yes, she does. Do you have the child? Uh, yes, my grandson. We had to hide. We had to hide my grandchild, but he was caught, and he's coming up for trial. 
please have everyone pray for justice in this man. He's only 23 years old. My daughter was 30. Just have everyone please pray for ju God's justice. Yes. Did, did she have any children? Yes, one boy, six and a half mother. And you have him? Yes. Thank God for that. I thank God for you. In this terrible tragedy, the very thing that people read every day and just get so full of despair. And you see, you proved tonight what I couldn't possibly have proven, no matter what I said. You proved that in the midst of a terrible, terrible tragedy and injustice, you followed Jesus as he was on the cross. And if people say you're crazy from the world, that's a compliment. You know, the world doesn't know what it's doing, doesn't know what it's all about. You've done the most magnificent thing, and I want to thank you for offering up all that terrible tragedy for ourselves here and all our EWTN family. Thank you for your courage and your strength. And thank you for thinking of us. And maybe that's why the Lord has blessed us. But people like you have had a terrible thing happen and forgive. And come through it without bitterness or despair. If we didn't have a lot of time, I think the program could have ended because uh, there's no better witness. And you see, as Christians today, with all this commotion going on all the time, there's where you, you have a marvelous opportunity to witness like this woman. Yeah, we have compassion and we have empathy and we reach out. But it can never enter to that place where despair, despair is never of God. Despair, you lose hope. You mean there's, there's nothing you can do. The world is at its worst. It's going to keep getting worse. And, and that's terrible. We have made it worse. We're the ones that condone abortion. We're the ones that condone crime and, and sex and, and no marriage. All the things we condone. We don't have the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong. And this is sinful. Oh, we never talk about sin anymore. Because we don't love enough to tell the truth. How many people you know are willing to tell you the truth? Huh? How many people love you enough to say, sweetheart, you're ruining yourself and jeopardizing your eternal salvation. Now stop it, will you? This is the, the world of human respect. It's like a, a, a little boy running, uh, getting near a cliff and his father don't want to protect him because he might, if he tackles him, he'll scratch himself. So he just runs all the way down the cliff and kills himself. You see, that doesn't make any. You know what human respect is? You don't know? Human respect is, if I have something to tell you that I know you're not going to like, but it's true, some harm you're putting yourself, some danger you're putting yourself in, or some, some error you're in, or some heresy you're in, and I don't tell you the truth. And the reason I don't tell you the truth is because I'm afraid you will think ill of me or you won't love me anymore or whatever. That's human respect, which means I am more concerned about your, your love for me or your respect for me than I am for your salvation. That's dangerous. That means you don't love at all. See? I can tell you one thing. I love you all very much. And I'm going to tell it like it is. Because I want you in heaven. And I'm not going to let you go. 
somewhere else. We have another call. Hello? Yes, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Indiana. My name is John. And what is your question? Well, I have a comment, and I'd like to, uh, since the program is on despair, I'd like to offer something of an antidote to despair. Good. Uh, this is my 11th year anniversary of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. Good. And one of the things that I learned through all of the despair prior to my getting into Alcoholics Anonymous and returning to the church was the, the benefit of prayer. Yeah. And I would just like to share for all of those 12-step people out there the 11th step, and I think it says it all, and it is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And I'll tell you, that's carried me through a lot of times when I could have despaired about sobriety, I could have despaired about my faith, and a whole lot of other things. Right. And one of the things I do remember in all of my travels, in you know, a visit to the Sistine Chapel back uh, in the 60s, the painting behind the altar uh, by Michelangelo in the uh, lower right-hand corner, as you face the altar, there is a man sitting, and he is the embodiment of despair. Right. I'll never forget that, and I don't want to feel that way again. God bless you. Well, I love your program. You. Thank you. And I'd like to hug that lady from Chicago, too. I understand I, what she's going through. I know. I think we all want to hug her. But that's true. You see, without prayer, you can't. And that's why the rosary is so important. And I don't care if you're Catholic or Protestant. I don't care what you are, who you are. You ought to say it. And the reason you ought to say it is because it's a simple, simple prayer, but it's powerful. Why is it powerful? God made it so. I don't have to know why. You know, I think we have to know why. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why? Why? Why you got to know why? Here it is. See how simple that is? Just imagine that if we'd all said this since 1917, none of this would have happened. That terribly simple, huh? I hope you feel bad, all you Catholics out there. Haven't said a rosary, you don't even know what one looks like anymore. I bet it's somewhere in a in one of your chest of drawers, you know, it's way in the back. Why don't you go get it tonight before you go to bed? See how rusty it is. That other woman showed me her rosary. It was silver, but it was all tarnished. And she says, oh, I got to clean this. And I said, oh, I know how you can clean it. <laughs> if you'd have been saying it all this time, it wouldn't be tarnished. So I'd like you all to go, all you Catholics out there that haven't said a rosary in years. Don't blame it on your priest because he won't let you say it before Mass, after Mass, or in between. You are, you're deaf and blind. You can't go in your room and say it by yourself. This little thing here, and it's small, huh? would have saved this whole country from being, and this whole world from being in the rotten shape it's in. But it's not too late. Start. Start tonight. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? Pennsylvania, Ringtown, Pennsylvania. What's your question? Mother, I work uh, in what is called a student assistance program, and I... I work with about seven different school districts in a, mm -hmm. in a small county in Pennsylvania here. And I'm dealing constantly with, with children uh, everywhere from ages 8th grade up through 12th grade yeah. with suicides, uh, oh, self-mutilation, yeah. uh, drug and alcohol abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. You name it, I, I mean, I deal with it. Yeah. And kids who are really, really hurting, really in a lot of pain, come from very dysfunctional families where there's a lot of pain. And I guess it, my question is, how do I keep, uh, it's not that I despair, but I find myself getting a real negative oh, yeah. kind of an outlook. You know, I'm, I'm, help, I'm trying to help these kids and, you know, half the time you run into a brick wall. I do pray for them at times, but within the, the field itself, I guess, it's 
seems that a lot of the professional people themselves have, uh, shall we say, a lack of faith. They're either agnostic or outright atheistic in their belief systems. And I really struggle, you know, trying to get across uh, to these people, you know, that there is a God. And, and just like you were saying earlier, he is in control of things. But I find myself even doubting at times when I deal with this day in and day out, day in, day out. Tomorrow I have to go out. A little girl was killed, run over by a car, and I'm going to go into an elementary school and try and deal with those issues, deal with the family and deal with these kids. And, you know, St. Augustine, going all the way back to him, had talked about if there's a good God, how can there be such evil? And I look at these issues and these kids and the pain. and I myself am in pain trying to deal with it. Yeah. I think what you need to do is, is what Mother Teresa does. She sees the worst kind of poverty, leprosy, people alive being eaten up by maggots, um, the worst of humanity in every part of the world. And I think a person like you, and I address teachers, priests, religious, parents. You must see Jesus in all of this. In all of this, you must see Jesus. Otherwise, you will despair. You will become disheartened. And you lose your faith. You must see Jesus in that abused child. And then when you see him in that child, your love for that child will come out, and that will be the healing element, not what you say. You see a wino or a beggar, and you see these children coming, and they got black eyes, and they're abused. See Jesus crucified with a black eye and abused. What you do to the least you do to me. You, above all people, all your social workers and teachers, Mother Teresa is that great example for you. And she never despairs. She has on her face that serenity that comes from constantly saying these little bids. She never forgets who's in charge. She's never forgotten where these children are going. How many lepers has she held in her arms and sent off to the kingdom? If you look only at the horror of what's going on, you lose hope and faith. But if you take a hold of that abused child, and even though they may be hard and calloused and because they've had to fight to survive, I didn't know God for a long time. I was busy surviving. Survival is the rule. Survival is the law. I have time to think of God and pray. What good would it do? At least that's what you thought at the time. And that's how these kids think. But I've often wondered what I would have done if a sister or a priest, or anyone for that matter, would have put their arms around me and said, hey, Have courage, huh? There is a God and he loves you. Don't despair. Let's work on this together. I'm convinced that it isn't that bowl of rice that Mother Teresa gives. Anybody can give a bowl of rice. There's that part of Jesus in her that sees Jesus in that destitute, desperate, diseased individual. 
But when Mother Teresa came here one time, she said the poverty in America was much worse than India. Not physical, not hunger, but the spiritual poverty. I attest to that. I attest that the spiritual poverty in this country is an abomination. You can pick up a leper in his destitution and pain, make him reach out to you in love and gratitude. But the de there's no desperation in the worldly and the calloused, the hard, you see. And so you must be even greater than Mother Teresa. You must give even more love and more compassion. You must not only be Jesus to these children, they haven't seen any Jesus yet in this whole wide world. It's nothing but rot and pain and suffering. That's all they know. It's not their fault either. Think of this little body who is bruised and hardened because it has no love, no joy. See Jesus. And if you and I don't see Jesus in everything that happens, good, bad, or indifferent, I will not be purified or sanctified, and I will not help to sanctify others. Because if I am as blind as they are, then it's the blind leading the blind, isn't it, huh? You can't afford to be negative. You can't afford to lose faith. Your faith must increase with every new child you see that needs help. And yeah, they don't listen. Because sometimes they listen, they've been done it. They're streetwise. It doesn't take long to get streetwise. So it takes from you love and patience. Maybe that's how God's going to sanctify you, huh? That that's what they need. More than anything else in the whole world. They need your love and your compassion. And you need to pray, not once. I think I heard you say once in a while. <laughs> I got news for you, sweetheart. That's not enough. You got to do it all the time in your car when you're going from one school to another school. You got to really pray. Because if you don't, you know, you, you're not going to make it. And I don't mean you have to be pray, oh, Mary, oh, Mary, oh, Mary, all the time. It's his prayer in your heart. You have to really depend upon the Lord. See, that's what I mean. Anyway, we have another call. Hello? Hello? Hold on. Okay, well, hold on. I want you to, all of you, you to read St. Paul. Read St. Paul's 2 Corinthians, the 4th chapter, and the 4th chapter, and the 1st Corinthians. And, and find out why it is. And I'll tell you right off the bat, it's because we don't pray, we don't see Jesus in the present moment, we don't see Jesus in pain and suffering. We're kind of an hallelujah people. That's wonderful. We should sing hallelujah in the midst of pain if you really want to be a Christian. But some people can't do that, you know. But there can be in all of us as Christians a love and a peace. If, every, if you're a Christian and you're despairing, who will be able to look up to you for an example? Huh? If you've made a mistake, then be courageous enough to handle it. Put your hand in the hand of Jesus and go on. Don't worry. He's not going to let you down. He'll never let you down. That's where St. Paul is, you know. He says, I'm cursed, but I answer with a blessing. How do you answer? I'm hounded. 
he puts up with it. People after him day in, day out, day in, day out. Some of you have nagging wives. Some of you have nagging husbands. He said he puts up with it. He's beaten. How many times was he beaten? I forget. I think what he's got the perils of Pauline in here somewhere. <laughs> Did you ever hear the perils of Paul? Yeah, he was, he was, you know, beaten up and scourged how many times, and he got, you know, thrown off a boat and in the ocean. And oh, golly, you just wonder how he survived. But he did, how? By prayer and by seeing Jesus in everything and everyone. That's the only solution to our problems. And we're all going to suffer. We all suffer. Every time I think of a fetus being used for experimentation, I get the shivers all up my spine. I, I, it's, just a, I, I, it's just intolerable to think of a doctor whose hands were geared by God to heal, tearing apart a little baby, huh? This strange world we live in, huh? But what's going to heal it? God. Prayer on our part. We have to be men and women of prayer and accept whatever purification the Lord gives the whole world. We're a part of it. We suffer with those who suffer. We laugh with those who laugh. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We cry with those who cry. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. What I do to the least, I do to Jesus. Keep your courage up. Keep your hope up. Heaven's just around the corner. Bye now. Order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store. Log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Or call 1-800-854-6316. Pursue what matters most in 2022. Life, liberty, truth. From the Capitol to the classroom, from the pulpit to the pew, EWTN's National Catholic Register delivers in-depth news, analysis, and commentary through the lens of the Catholic faith. With so much at stake in our country, there's never been a more important time to read the register. And with award-winning Catholic journalism that goes beyond what you'll find from any secular news service, you'll get the real story behind the events that unfold over the course of the year. Try the register for free today and get it delivered to your home, office, or parish. Join the Catholics who depend on the register for its faithful and courageous reporting. Get six free issues today online at ncregister.com forward slash TV 
or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. That's ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. EWTN News In Depth is engaging and informative, but don't just take our word for it. Monse Alvarado is probably the most professional, quick thinking, and engaged news anchor. I cannot say enough good things about what I heard. God bless your every effort. Your new program is very much needed and on track. Kudos and congratulations on the new show. Monse is sharp, clear, and moves the news along. EWTN News In Depth is unique in its coverage of the issues and the people making news in the U.S the Vatican, and around the world. This program will help Catholics have a better understanding of the news. Every week, it's a new conversation, a new chance to dig deep into questions about who we are as Catholics and how we can confidently live our faith in the world. This is something people are wanting. Thanks a ton. Yes, I'll be watching. Kudos to EWTN on this great new program. EWTN News In Depth. Engaged. Informed. Catholic. Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Hello, family. Years ago, I asked Mother Angelica what she thought the legacy of EWTN would be. Without hesitation, she said that it would be the fact that this network was created and sustained by relying entirely on divine providence. For this reason, she knew that special individuals, people who love Jesus and his church, would step forward to donate to EWTN. And she was right. Throughout our 40-year history, EWTN has been blessed with many people who support this mission of proclaiming the eternal word, Jesus Christ, to the nations. With your help, this network has inspired countless individuals, those who have come into the church, fallen away Catholics who have returned to the sacraments, and the homebound who can watch daily mass. And today, I hope that you'll go online to tell us your stories of the ways that EWTN has touched your life. I look forward to hearing from you. And I ask that you consider making a gift today, a gift that will inspire people worldwide who grow closer to our Lord, His Blessed Mother, and the saints. Thank you for being a part of our EWTN family. May God bless you. To share your story or to make a donation, please visit EWTN.com slash my story. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Oleads Road, Irondale, Alabama, different peoples are coming to this country and also uh, within the the church itself in our parishes is uh, a bringing about of life. I think Mother Angelica came along at just the right time to set up EWTN because what it's done is given Catholic film producers, directors like myself a platform. You rediscover the, the sacrament of the moment in the present moment and, and knowing God in that moment that it is about give us this day our daily bread.